Hello and welcome to the i3 podcast. My name is Wouter Klein and I'm the Director of Content for the Investment Innovation Institute. For more information about our educational forums for institutional investors, please visit our website at www.i3-invest.com. There you can also subscribe to our complimentary newsletter, i3 Insights in which we discuss investment strategy and asset allocation questions with asset owners around the world. Now, as you all know, we love our disclaimers in this industry, so here's ours. This recording is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice. Please enjoy the show. Welcome to the IFE podcast. I'm here today with Stuart Brentnell, Chief Investment Officer of T Corp, the asset management arm of the state of New South Wales. Stuart, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Walter. So it's been uh, an interesting time uh, over the last two months. How is everybody holding up at uh, T Corp with the coronavirus going on? Well, well, the answer is well, thank you, Voter. It has been a very interesting time. Uh, overall, people have, have done really well. We have a small and a close-knit team at T-Corp. We were all working in the same building on two floors, and we've just moved into that building, um, which means that we've had excellent new technology, which has allowed us to work remotely very easily and seamlessly. There's a clear operating model in the investment team, and that's also working well. It means we're communicating with each other very regularly on portfolios. They're doing what they're supposed to do. We can continue to maintain the daily functioning of these. And we've done a lot of communication with clients who are, I won't say happy with what's happened in the markets, but they're content that funds have been run daily and the portfolios are behaving as they should be. Yeah, well, I'm glad it's all going well. Let's start at the beginning. Can I ask you a little bit about how you got started in investments? Yes, certainly, Voter. When I was in university, I actually wanted to be a pilot. And I'd already trained as a private pilot and had my license. My father was a commercial pilot and had been for many years and flying fascinated me. But that was at the time of the oil shocks and joining an airline was impossible. So I decided that I'd get a flexible qualification. So I became a chartered accountant. One thing led to another and I came out to Australia with Deloitte's. I did some really interesting accounting investigations with Deloitte's and in fact my first boss while I was seconded to Clayton Utes, the law firm which was doing a piece of work for CSR that related to their blue asbestos business from the 1960s, was Julie Bishop, who ran the Perth practice. I really enjoyed the forensic and accounting uh, analytical work, which I'd done as, for a few years, and that led me to join Schroeder's as an analyst in the equities team, and that's where it all started. I stayed with them for nearly 10 years, joined QIC for two years running international equities, researched European banks with Goldman Sachs for two years in London, and more recently did five years at BT and eight years at ANZ. And now I've been at T Corp for three years. Yeah. So you have had a very interesting career. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the more memorable projects that you've worked on before you joined uh, T Corp? Sure, sure. If we go back to Schroeder's days, first of all, not long after I joined, we were awarded a $300 million mandate and in the 1990s, that was pretty large, from the Dutch pension fund, PGGM. It was in three parts. One was an Australian one, one was a Singaporean mandate, and one was a Hong Kong mandate with the rest of Asia. Running that was very interesting, working with Schroeder colleagues across Asia and working very closely with different parts of PGGM to really understand their portfolios and their needs. After Schroeder's, I joined BT and took on the mandate of internalizing their multi-manager funds with a small team, in fact, including Adrian Troller, who now works with me at T-Corp. Multi-manager was a core part of the distribution and advice offering for BT. Historically, it had been run as an implemented consulting platform with Intech behind it, but BT wanted to insource that and build a solution that was more customizable for their different channels. In all, it was a two-year project to bring the funds in-house and to grow them into a $3 billion product. Pretty interesting, some new, new turf that we turned. Then I was at ANZ for eight very interesting years. I actually joined ING Australia, which ANZ had just bought, in the new CIO position and really built a function that didn't look unlike what I'd done at BT, serving all ANZ's different customer channels, an advisor channel, a direct channel, 
a private wealth business, a super and pension platform, and an Asian business with its own investment needs. As CIO, I was asked to create a central investments function, which selected external partners, ran the asset allocation, built portfolios, and offered solutions out to each of those channels. Again, it was a very interesting project and business model, and it equipped me very well for T Corp with the amalgamation that was needed here. Yeah. So you mentioned internalization, which is uh, very topical at the moment with uh, a number of funds going through that. I believe that uh, within T Corp, certain assets are run internally, but not all of them. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, certainly. Let's take a step back. When I joined, my main mission was to bring three investment ecosystems together the T Corp investment team, the state super investment team, and what is now called iCare, the investment team from, from iCare, and to build a single best practice model. Central to that is to determine what the customer mandates are and then to understand how best to deliver those. A core part of this is to determine what one's comparative advantages are and to leverage them. At T Corp, we have two, the domestic cash and bond team and the real assets team, which we inherited from state super, who had run unlisted real estate and infrastructure assets in-house for some time. We've continued investing in those two parts of the business, where I think we still have a comparative advantage and where we can bring highly customised and ultimately better risk-adjusted return solutions to clients. So that's a significant part of our model now and a significant part of our mission and strategy to build best practice. So if we look at the investment side, T Corp has been moving away from a strategic asset allocation to a total portfolio approach. Why is this important? Well, it's important because there's a really basic question one has to ask here. Each of our clients essentially has a a long-term investment objective and their success is binary. They either meet that or they don't. So the question, How can we build an end-to-end investment philosophy, process, and model that fully aligns with our customer objective? This involves a few things which are simple to talk about, but not so simple to build. Number one, a recognition that once we've agreed an investment objective and risk appetite with the client, the next most important thing is to understand how much risk we need to take in the portfolio to achieve this. But this is at the total portfolio and not in the individual sectors as is commonly. Secondly, we need to recognize that asset classes don't very well describe the amount or complexity of risk that they bring to a portfolio. And one needs to look through them to the individual securities that comprise them to build a holistic picture of the complexion of risk at the total portfolio level. Thirdly, a sector approach actually brings agency risks into the process. As soon as you break up the customer investment objective into a proxy benchmark, an SAA, and give each of those parts a component of capital, you'll create silos, and in so, silo behaviors. You've created a set of sector benchmarks that don't have much alignment with the client's investments objectives. You're actually encouraging people to do things that are not aiming for a holistically optimal investment result for the client. Yeah. So can you give us some practical examples of how this um, approach has led to changes in the portfolio? Yes, absolutely. We no longer use an SAA approach. So starting, starting from the risk perspective, the first two steps are to express the portfolio or the customer's needs in a very simple, implemented, implementable version, uh, maybe just with equities, treasuries, credit and cash. A portfolio that everyone understands, our clients, the board, the investment committee, and the investment team. From there to the final client portfolio, every opportunity needs to be tested and needs to be able to show that it will increase the risk-adjusted returns that are delivered to the clients. So change number one, if we look at the opportunities, we don't just compare them within each sector. We compare each potential investment opportunity to everything else in the portfolio in a way that we iterate qualitatively and quantitatively, it's not all science, and establish which are the best opportunities to add risk-adjusted returns in the most efficient way for the portfolio. Then we we come back to the question around agency risk. A sector-based process, I think, will seek to construct the risk in the portfolio and then select a component so that it will diversify active risk but at the sector level, usually by approaching, uh, appointing a number of different managers in each sector. 
Now, if you multiply that by the number of sectors, you're usually going to end up with a very large number of managers. That was the case with T Corp, with these three organizations coming together. So the second change that we've really been able to make is to streamline the portfolio and have a significantly smaller number of relationships, but that are deeper and more strategic in nature. You can see from the simplistic, more holistic nature of the portfolio that it makes the implementation a lot more straightforward. So there are operational efficiencies, investment improvements, and ultimately there are people and culture improvements because the entire team is working together to achieve the same thing. Yeah, so in this new approach, um, I also understand that you take equity risk as the starting point um, of assessing every investment against. Is that right? Look, essentially it is. We we asked two questions. How much risk do we need to take and what is the complexion of that risk? There's a reality to life here. To harvest a return above cash, we need to take risk. Now, once we've thought about that, we quickly get to the conclusion that equity risk, it it is actually equity risk that dominates in any portfolio. It dominates the, the risk in that portfolio. It dominates the returns that that portfolio delivers. Equity risk, um, therefore, is an extremely logical starting point to, to model. Um, and we ultimately work out how we deliver the returns we need by virtue of doing that first and then understanding how we can diversify that equity risk with other forms of risk that pay off differently. So you mentioned earlier that uh, this has also driven a little bit of change in the culture of the organization. How was the new model received and was there a bit of pushback as well? I I think that's best described by saying it's been a journey, not an event. Look, it's, it's changes rarely get everybody's approval at the start line. We humans really weren't built for change. And when you look at the engagement around the process for change, we're always going to have people with different styles. I think you can divide these into three. Style one is a high risk appetite supporter who absolutely gets what the motive is and and what one wants to do. They support 150% and they're agnostic to the discomfort that it's going to cause them along the journey. Style two, the vast majority of people, they understand the change, they're inwardly supportive, but they're a bit nervous and anxious about what it means because they don't know what the consequences will be for themselves. Nonetheless, with the appropriate engagement and support, communication and encouragement, they'll come on the journey and they'll help the change to the new model. There are a few people who are skeptics and who make the journey a little bit more difficult, but that's a reality of life. Change management's never, never easy. Humans are probably the largest part of it, and a cultural approach to change is, is absolutely essential, and that's really how we've, we've approached it at T-Corp. It's been three years. It's been a long journey. We're not yet complete, but we're in, we're in a much better place now. And uh, you know, I think we, we have broad understanding and therefore endorsement and support of all our different stakeholders, the executive board, the board investment committee, and clients for the journey that we're going on. Yeah, change is always uh, hard to uh, accept, I think, for some people. But it also, the changes that were made within T Corp have uh, created a completely new structure where there are seven different teams uh, responsible for different parts of the investment process. So how does this model of, of those seven teams help in the total portfolio approach? By, by aligning and streamlining, Vota, let, let's go back to my point about agency risk. What what we've sought to do is to change the structure so that there are still teams, but that they all have extremely clear functions and they're all aligned to that single client investment objective. So we, we ultimately have the maximum probability of delivering that objective, whether it's the client advisory team that engages with the client, does the risk appetite work with them and agrees on the investment objective, whether it's the portfolio construction team that's putting all the bits together, or whether it's the partner selection team that's responsible right across the sectors for for selecting our external managers in a completely consistent way, or whether it's our stewardship or implementation functions, they all have a very clear purpose, but they all work together and are aligned with what the customer is trying to achieve. You mentioned you look for more strategic relationship with uh, managers. Now, I think that a model of strategic partnerships came out of the US with uh, Texas teachers, but people seem to have different interpretations of that model. Can you tell me a little bit about how you look at the partnerships? Um, Look, I I look at this with a rather 
simplistic um, lens in mind, perhaps to say that the best way of operating a strategic partnership is for each side to be really clear on what their proposition is and what their contribution to the relationship is going to be. We look for partners ultimately that are able to put themselves in our shoes and to absolutely understand our mission and mandates our clients' risk appetites and, and ultimately the constraints that we face so that they can help in the most contextually sensible way. Looking at that single client investment objective, look, it's not always easy for organisations to do that. Um, sometimes they're quite narrow and only offer certain capabilities. Sometimes they might be very large but have historically operated on a siloed product basis rather than a customer one. Increasingly, we're finding now that organisations are accepting the challenges that I've outlined and really seeking to have that broader and deeper relationship with their clients to quickly identify and access all of their different capabilities and make it as easy as possible for the clients to access them. And for that to be able to, to be done in a coordinated way, so that there aren't too many touch points and not huge numbers of people on either side of the fence. Yeah. So T Corp has become a very large organization, um, around 100 billion in assets. And often when organizations become this large, um, for, for practical reasons, there is a bit of shift into more passive, uh, passively managed strategies. What are your thoughts on the split between active and passive? So firstly, yes, you're right. We're an organization that manages around 100 billion, e even after events of the last few weeks. Um, and this does present challenges that smaller organizations don't face. We, we simply can't be as nimble and dynamic in moving money around asset classes. However, that in itself is not um, a condition uh, where one should immediately say, let's move to passive, it's all too hard. Our mission is to provide customers with the best post-fee risk-adjusted returns that we can. And it's important to get a really clear lens on that and to combine that with the point I made on comparative advantages. That The start point may be a relatively passive part for portfolio, but if we can do better than that, we should, and we should try really hard to. In the portfolios at the moment, a very significant part of our capital is active. So we look really hard for the parts of the market that are inefficient, and where we feel we can enter them effectively and where we have a clear understanding of how to exit them effectively as well. Uh, it's really important to look at this in both directions because uh, we've, we've actually not, not just got to be able to identify where there are active returns, but we've in fact got to be able to harvest them. So the transfer coefficient has got to be low. Some of this actually involves uh, sourcing assets in an advantaged way from our peer group. So I'll give you an example of that. Uh, we've, we've made several purchases from our Canadian peers in the industry over the past six months, where both sides have approached a transaction deciding they don't want to go through public auctions. We've agreed a price up front. We've agreed a bilateral process. And we've done deals at very acceptable prices uh, in, on quick horizons as well, which has enabled us to access some really attractive active returns on opportunities that have really delivered excellent things for our clients. Yeah, talking about the uh, Canadians, um, they have an interesting model. So over the last sort of 10 year, um, you could see that they focus very heavily on unlisted assets and also on the internalization of investment management. And, and that has very, done very well for them. But it's also a relatively expensive model. And, and so going forward, you think, well, returns will be lower and this expensive model might not do as well. What, what are your thoughts on the Canadian model? I've studied it a lot, especially in, in the first year that I spent at T Corp, and I think the Canadians have a fascinating model. There are, re there are really three things that uh, collectively differentiate their model. Number one, their boards are completely independent of their sponsor governments. Number two, the ability for their boards to hire whatever staff they want on whatever terms. And number three, that for that board then to delegate heavily to that staff, to the executive team. This is, this is very intuitive and very virtuous. It does overlook one thing, however, that is very different at T Corp. T Corp's a, a rather unique organization with both the debt issuer and the investment management operations under one roof. We are in a unique position with those two capabilities to provide enormously useful and helpful advice to our government sponsor, provided we stay quite close to them. 
so uh, quite co quite the contrary we don't want to be differentiated and, and separate from government we want to be close to them we've got a very competent team that i was allowed to assemble in in the first three years and thankfully we've agreed with the board that we we do also um, earn the privilege to have a lot of investment decisions delegated to us I always find it interesting that, that boards meet four to six times a year, discuss investments for 30 to 45 minutes each time, and therefore actually only talk about them for two to three hours a year. So I'm, I'm absolutely convinced it is the right thing for a board to delegate heavily to a competent, competent executive team. And that's, that's worked really well for us at, at T Corp. I think unlisted assets are, are something um, that should be particular to clients that have the right horizon and the right uh, risk appetite for, for that level of liquidity. Subject to those two, that's also been a very successful strategy for both the Canadians and ourselves. Yes, these things are expensive to manage, but at the end of the day, our principal objective is indeed to bring post-fee returns to the clients rather than focusing on, on cost itself. And finally, internalizing is something I think organizations need to be very careful of in a governance sense. A board should treat an internal team exactly as it would uh, an external team. So if something goes wrong or if a process changes or ceases to be suitable for, for the client's mandate, the board should be willing to terminate that team. Internalizing, of course, makes that harder. It brings in agency risk nearer to the, to the client the larger the internal capability gets, the more difficult it gets to fire in times of underperformance. And I think there are, are pockets of, of uh, large asset owners around the world, possibly including Canada, that are finding this, I believe, quite challenging now. Yeah. But look, at the end of the day, at the, at the end of the day, um, I think this model stood in great stead. It's delivered for the, for the amount of risk in the portfolio, better returns than much of the rest of the world to the Canadian pension clients. Um, we feel at T-Corp, we're able to pick the best parts out of that model without simply replicating the whole lot. Fair enough. So we started off with talking about uh, the coronavirus, but if we draw this a little bit more broadly... How well is T-Corp positioned to deal with um, drawdowns like this, with, with sort of crisis situations? I think, uh, I think we're very fortunate. Um, I think this starts with, with really strong governance. We've, we've got a good board. They've put in place a great board investment committee with whom we have really deep strategic engagements um, and challenging discussions. Now, you know, out of this comes a, a, a very strong process. Out of this comes ultimately a, a very clear mandate that our clients have. And out of this comes a, a very clear initial engagement with those clients where we've done the work on risk appetite, risk appetite statements. So uh, as I may have said at the beginning, I won't say that the clients are happy in the current situation, but they're very content with how their portfolios are set up for their purpose. And they're, they're very content that they're doing what they're supposed to, notwithstanding the drawdowns of the last few weeks. So we spend a lot of time with clients, more so in the last month, uh, who have long horizons and high risk appetites saying, you've got a portfolio which is going to deliver what you need in the long term. It will be subject to pain in the short term, but it's designed well, it's operating within expected parameters, and it can live through what we're going through at the moment, and worse indeed, if that were to come. It will deliver in the, in the long term. The clients, our board investment committee and our board um, have thoroughly embraced that. So it's, um, you know, we're actually in a good place for this. What are the data points for this? Well, number one, we're having, as I said, a lot of additional communications with clients. Number two, there's plenty of liquidity in our portfolios as per design to enable them to continue operating. Number three, we can transact and do what we need to do on a daily basis. That's basically rebalancing foreign exchange hedging uh, and tail risk hedging monetization for a small number of portfolios, which are particularly sensitive to the downside. And because we have the right operating model, and because we have adequate liquidity in the portfolios, we can do all of that. We're really in a very fortunate position um, that not all of our portfolios are in superannuation. In fact, only two of them. So we have greater certainty of cash flows and we don't, uh, we're not going to be subject to the uncertainty around many end customer decisions in terms of either withdrawing money from their superannuation accounts or choosing to uh, allocate away from growth options into cash and the, the, the difficulties that poses for super fund investment teams and their trustee boards. So now that the new model is implemented, um, is that it? Is it all done and dusted? I'd like to say yes, Voter, but no, it's absolutely not. Success is never final. This is, this is a long journey. 
Um, and there'll be many different aspects that, that continue to be presented that need work on. If I go back to the beginning of this project, we in fact quickly became aware that this wasn't a single project. It was in fact a four part one. Change one was the governance, uh, the business model, which we, we dealt with up front. I've described that with the board and the board investment committee. The second was changing the investment model. That's ongoing. There's going to be developments to that for years yet to come. Um, even if we are well advanced on it now. The third was the organizational structure, people and culture. So we needed to change the organization and structure to, to get something that was aligned with the new model working. And um, we also needed to go on a, a very interesting cultural, cultural journey to understand the differences with the sector model, which we, we feel we've done quite well now. Fourth, the fourth one's an operating model change where information and data and the ability to access that, uh, to use it for a TPA model was, was critical and completely different from what we previously had. We, we've relied heavily in the past on custodial information and, and Microsoft spreadsheets to, to um, help that, to complement that. But really, we need much deeper and richer information to operate that TPA model. So we've now installed the BlackRock Aladdin system which basically um, enters every single investment security that we own, generates a very enriched set of data, which we can cut and dice in many ways, and allows us to reflect the portfolio, both through a capital lens and a risk lens in ways that we couldn't possibly have done before. So, uh, you know, that too, it's just been installed. That was, that was done after we had just gone remote. It included a DR test on day two, which was interesting. But that too will have developments to it, which we'll be doing, I think, for many years to come. So we're, we're all working together down with our clients down that journey. Um, in my view, it's probably a never ending one, even if we've broken the back of it and done a lot of the heavy lifting. Yeah, well, that, this was certainly a very interesting discussion, uh, Stuart. And uh, thank you very much for your time. That's my pleasure, Voter. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the i3 podcast. For more information, please visit www.i3-invest.com. Thank you very much.